Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, my name is Jessalyn Norcross, and I am right now in beautiful Petoskey, Michigan, at the tip of the mitt in Michigan. And we carry our map with us. And so we're located right here. Uh, we would love to know where you are. So in the chat box, go ahead and tell us uh, where you're joining us from, because we would love to know uh, where we're broadcast broadcasting. Um, tonight we are joined by Viola Shipman, aka Wade Rouse, one of our all-time favorite authors here at the store. Um, we have learned so many things about Wade over the years, including his love for frosting. <laughs> um, there are there are many things that booksellers learn and that um, that we keep to ourselves, kind of like bartenders. Um, so we know a lot of things about our authors and um, that's the only thing that I'm going to share. Don't worry, Wade. Um, <laughs> um, I want to uh, remind everybody that we have lots of fun freebies because Viola is a giving soul. And not only has he given us uh, five uh, heirloom novels so far, the sixth is the one we'll be discussing this evening, The Clover Girls by Viola Shipman. And everyone who orders the book, which is not out until May 9th? 18th. May 18th. I should be able to remember that. Do you know there are a lot of books coming out that day? It's a huh. huge publication day. Hans. So everybody needs to put the Clover Girls right at the top of the list. That's right. Let's see how far we can get it. So every um, order that you place with us or you place with Valley Bookseller in Stillwater, Minnesota will register with the New York Times. And so you'll be given a little vote for Viola. So keep that in mind if you love him as much as we do. And not only that, you will get one of the coveted clover bookmarks with the gold looking finish. These are darling. I want to carry them here in the store. They're so pretty. And one, uh, excuse me, two lucky winners, one from the Valley Bookseller list and one from the McLean and Aiken list will win a special edition Clover Girls bag, handmade. I love this. It is so darling. And it has even a little key fob with the same fabric on it that goes inside and you can attach it or not. It's so cute. Um, so two, two lucky people will win these. You cannot win if you don't play, as they say. So you need to order a copy of Viola's book from either McLean and Aiken or Valley Bookseller in order to be registered to win one of these. And we will announce it the day after Mother's Day. The other thing that you can win by ordering one of Viol or ordering the Clover Girls is a gift card, a $50 gift card from either McLean and Aiken or Valley Bookseller, depending upon where you buy your book. Uh, and you don't have to stop at one. You can buy one book for yourself. You can buy another book for your mother. You can buy another book for your grandmother. You can buy one for your stepmother. You can buy one for the woman who lives next door, who has horrible children who don't buy her copies of books. And so you <laughs> will buy it for her. Um, every time you purchase a book, you'll be registered. So don't hold back. Don't hold back. Go ahead and buy as many copies as you want. There's no limit. Cinco de Mayo, um, that order. There you go. Five times. <laughs> There you go. I like it. Um, so we've got a lot of people commenting in the chat from South Carolina, uh, North Carolina, Holland, Michigan. Um, let's see. Da, da, da. Palm Springs. Yay. <laughs> and everybody looks so excited to get their book and their bookmarks. So it sounds like a lot of people have already ordered there. So that's wonderful. You can add another one tonight. No problem. We won't stop you. Um, but if you did order it with us or you did order it with Valley Bookseller, you're on the list. So no worries there. And I'm going to let Pam take it away. She is our consummate host this evening. Uh, Pam is also one of the most well-respected book um, reviewers in our industry. There is not a show that I have, a book show that I have ever gone to where I have not seen a Pamela Klingerhorn quote that has moved me either to tears or 
made me want to buy the book myself. And I don't buy very many books. I own a bookstore. I can usually just find a copy that someone will send me. Pam even makes me want to buy books. So we are so lucky to be joined by her this evening as well. Um, and I just thank you all for including us in this. We are so excited to support Wade. Um, and I'm just gonna let Pam take it away. Thank you so much, Jessalyn. It's such an honor to be here with you tonight. We have known each other for quite a long time because we're in the Midwest Booksellers Association together. And so it's really fun to finally get to host an event together for none other than the wonderful Wade Rouse. So um, he is a Midwesterner from my home state of Michigan. I now live in Minnesota and work for Valley Bookseller, which is on the shores of the beautiful St. Croix River. Um, Jessalyn's store is in beautiful northern Michigan, but Wade's joining us tonight from California because they're still <laughs> enjoying the nice weather. So as you know, the Clover Girls is written under Wade Rouse's pen name, Viola Shipman, and he has created an absolutely wonderful host of novels under this name. So whether you fell in love with Viola Shipman's book from the very first one, The Charm Bracelet, or if the Clover Girls is going to be your first venture into Wade's world, I can guarantee that you're going to be back for more. In the publishing business, a short synopsis of a novel's plot is called an elevator pitch. And because it should be brief enough that you can hear it in the time it takes to ride an elevator. Now, Wade holds the distinction of being the one and only author to ever give me his elevator pitch in an actual elevator. Some colleagues and I were in Chicago for a book convention when we met Wade and he was waiting at the elevator with us. So when we got in the elevator, he announced he was one of the authors and he gave us the pitch for his very first novel, The Charm Bracelet. And we were absolutely charmed. So Wade is now launching his sixth Viola Shipman novel and we've been told there's a seventh one coming in the fall. This is a beautiful tribute to friendship and summer camp. I still have my best friends from fifth grade in Michigan, and you can bet they're each getting a copy of the Clover Girls with the gorgeous golden bookmark. So if you order from either Valley Bookseller or McLean and Aiken by May 9th, you will be entered into the drawing that will take place on May 10th, one at each store. So that will be very exciting and every shopper will receive the golden Clover bookmark. Um, so. The links are going to be placed in the chat box to order your copy of the book. I'm hoping that Gary, the stage mother for Wade, will, <laughs> will uh, help me with some of those links and um, you can purchase your books. We will make sure that absolutely no one is disappointed. We have plenty of stock at both stores. So now let's all put our hands together and give Wade Rouse, writing as Viola Shipman, a great big welcome for the Clover Girls. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you for having me. Oh, thank you for joining us tonight, Wade. We're so thrilled to have you. I, have uh, to which, say, oh, mm -hmm. I do have to say this, you know, it's, I have to wish everybody happy early Mother's Day. And um, I have to say that Pam and Lit Lovers Night Out and McLean and Aiken were two of the first bookstores when I started to support me um, so fully. And as a new author, you go you're trying your darndest to go out and meet as many readers as possible and, and grow your audience. And I showed up at Pam's event in Minnesota. I showed up the very first time at McLean and Aiken and Petoskey to full houses, um, which is something that just doesn't happen every day. So from the bottom of my heart, I thank them for doing this. I want people to know that, you know, it was recently Independent Booksellers Day across America. Please, you know, Order, if you have ordered a copy of the Clover Girls, I hope you will order an, an additional copy um, from Valley Bookseller or McLean and Aiken. Lots of goodies to win. And, you know, it's a perfect book for friendship and for mothers. So thank you so much. It certainly is. You really can't order too many of these. So <laughs> I know, as I said, my friends will be getting some. And even my mother-in-law in Scotland is a Viola Shipman fan. Ah. 
she's going to be getting a belated Mother's Day gift of a copy of the Clover Girls as well. But Wade, why don't we start off with you giving us an elevator pitch about the Clover Girls? <laughs> sure, I love that story too, because <laughs> I remember it vividly. It was like my, really my first big publishing conference. Uh -huh. And I, you know, I was like, be so prepared, be so prepared. And I got asked and I delivered. So it was a big, it was a big you moment. <laughs> Yeah, the, in brief, The Clover Girls is, you know, it's an, a summer novel that is really a tribute to our forever friends' forgiveness, you know, not only of others, but also ourselves and the fragility of life. And it's about four very different girls who go to summer camp in northern Michigan in the 1980s and become the very best of friends. And as we all know, happens um, after they leave adulthood and life distances them um, until one of the girls receives a terminal Ill illness and reaches out to the three she's lost touch with and asks them to return to camp in order to, you know, reclaim the friendships they one ha once had, um, reclaim the, the women that they once were, and also to reclaim the dreams that they once had. And, you know, my grandma, my pen name, Viola Shipman, used to always say, life is as short as one blink of God's eye. And in that blink, we too often forget what's most important. And at the top of that list for her and for me has been our friends. Um, you know, a lot of love stories have been written about love and romance. I wanted to write a novel that was a love story about our friends. So, you know, I'm deeply proud of this book. You know, it's gotten some wonderful um, blurbs from Mary Alice Monroe and Christy Woodson Harvey. You just hit the New York Times bestseller list and Nancy Thayer. And, you know, I always say, if you have a BFF who knows you better than anyone in this world and completes you, then this is certainly the book for you. Most definitely. Would you like to give us a short reading from the novel? Sure, and I, I will keep it brief. Um, but, and it's hard to pick something that sums up the book, but I, you know, this book opens with um, letters from camp that a, one of the, girl, the Clover girls is sending back home to her parents. And that's how she also reaches back out to her um, friends who she's lost touch with. Because this is just a brief excerpt from the letter she sent them. I open the letter and a friendship pin, screaming E-V-E-R tumbles forth. And I immediately know who the letter's from, my friend Emily. How sweet, I think, the letter from M. She loves writing them. I bet she's on vacation. After all we went through, she wrote, why did the Clover girls end up losing touch? I know, I know we tell ourselves that's just what happens when we grow older and become adults. I stop, my heart catching. I take a deep breath and continue reading. I think of you and your mom often, Liz. You're as kind and as wonderful as she is. And I hope you'll never give up on your dreams of being a designer. The last few years have not been easy. I was diagnosed with breast cancer two years ago and though I underwent treatment, I've decided not to fight any longer. I'm sorry I lied to you about my health all this time. Believe me, it wasn't easy, but I know how overwhelmed you are. I didn't want to add any more stress on your life. As you know, I never married or had kids, so I got used to being alone, but being alone isn't so great when you're sick. So while I was still feeling okay, I opted to spend my last few summer weeks at camp. I guess I just wanted to be surrounded by friends, at least in spirit. I jumped in the lake and screamed like a girl when my body hit the cold water. I made s'mores over a campfire. I painted watercolors of beautiful white birch. I hiked the dunes and I watched the sunset. And on an evening walk back to camp, I found a four-leaf clover. I knew it was a sign, a sign of hope, a sign that paradise still exists and a sign that perhaps, just perhaps, the clover girls can be whole again. I finally realized it's little things that are the biggest things in life, like friends. Mostly I realized that life is as short as one blink of God's eye, and it's what we make of that single blink that matters. My friendship with the Clover Girls was what mattered most to me. Oh, that's beautiful. So it's such a lovely novel and a gorgeous tribute to friends and especially female friendship in particular. Can you share a little bit about how you came to write about these women, especially with such a deep sense of compassion and understanding? You know, all of the characters are inspired. Pe people always ask how much of fiction is real life. And usually it's a lot. Um, all of these characters, you know, there's four main characters. Um, v is a former supermodel who has a family now and has kind of lost um, who she was and the notoriety she had. Rachel's a political pundit. 
for kind of bad political candidates. Um, Liz is, you know, a, she wants to be a fashion designer. She is a real estate agent um, and she's caring for a dying mother. And then Emily is a librarian who was kind of the glue that kept them all together. You know, they're all inspired by friends of mine. Um, dear, dear friends of mine who are librarians, I actually have a friend here in Palm Springs that is a former model um, who, you know, her career was fascinating, but she also talked a lot about what it was like once kind of the limelight was over for her. Um, and moreover, you know, I, I spent my life growing up and, you know, the kitchens and um, sewing parlors and beauty salons with my grandmothers. And that's where I got to hear all of their stories with their friends. So all of the things I learned from them really inform the characters that I write about. And, you know, I try to bring women like my grandmother front and center in, in all the books I write, you know, good, strong, hardworking women that get knocked down by life too often and get back up again and just do their best to be good people. Um, that's, that's what I learned from my grandmothers and that's what inspires every novel that I write. I can definitely see that there's such a focus in all of your novels on the family. And so I mean, did your mother and your grandmothers, these people with whom you had such close relationships, did they nurture your early, early talent to become an author? Oh my gosh. Yeah. My grandma, both of my grandmothers were volunteers at our local library. So, you know, for, you know, I was a rural Ozarks boy growing up in the seventies and eighties. And, you know, sometimes all of this didn't do so well in, in rural America. And the library was my sanctuary. You know, the librarians became my dear friends. They, you know, they taught me um, that with my imagination that I could go anywhere and be anyone that I dreamed I could be, um, even though I was living in a very small town. So that changed me profoundly. You know, I've told this story before. Um, you know, in my rural middle school, I made the mistake of saying, I, I entered a talent contest and I sang Delta Dawn um, while holding a faded rose um, in front of a really a country group of folks. You know, they made the boys from Deliverance look like the Jonas Brothers. And it was not, it was not a good experience. And I was, I was heckled off stage and I ended up going back. I was crying and my mom and my grandmas were waiting as if they knew what was going to happen. And they gave me a copy of Irma Bombeck's first book at Wits End. And they gave me a writing journal and they told me to start um, writing about my life because it's how I was going to make sense of it. So you know, that really launched me. And, you know, I read with my grandmothers every single week. Um, you know, if they, if they could, they would bring a, a book back from the library or they'd buy a dime store paperback. And, you know, that's how we bonded um, greatly. So they influenced me so, so, so much. Yeah. That's wonderful. Did your grandmothers live to see your success? Um, my grandmothers passed away before my book was published, but, you know, um, I'll get emotional on Mother's Day. Um, you know, my grandma Shipman was, and my grandpa Shipman were working poor. They, my grandma Shipman was a seamstress. Um, she stitched overalls in a local factory until she couldn't stand straight. Um, my grandpa was an ore miner. When that work dried up, um, he raked rocks on farmers' fields um, to make money. Um, you know, they hunted and fished to put food on our family's table. Um, they had an old crock in their garage and they, any spare change they had, they tossed in it. Um, and when it got full, they took it to the community bank and started a college fund for my mom. And she became the first in our family to graduate college. And that changed my life and our family's life. You know, So um, me choosing a pen name is the smallest thank you I can give to my grandmother and all of our elders, because you know, I think we've been reminded this last year, as my grandma always said, of what's most important in life. And it's the things we take for granted. It's um, our family, our friends, um, our health, having a roof over our heads and each other. And those are the foundational themes that I write about um, in every book. And I try never to forget that. And you do it very well. It's, it's a gift to readers, thank you. If people have questions for Wade, please enter them in the Q&A box. Um, it's easier for me to monitor down there at the bottom of your page. If you move your cursor, you'll get a couple little bubbles that pop up that say Q&A and you can put a um, question in there for Wade and I will keep looking at those to see how we're doing. So Wade, when you're writing these novels, is it 
a character typically that brings you the story or a plot that you want to explore or how do you know how this tale needs to be told? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, for me, I always start with a question. Um, it's what I call my aha question and it drives every book that I write. It's, I actually write the question or two down and post it on my laptop so that it's always ever present. Um, you know, with this, with the Clover Girls, it was life is fragile, um, too fragile as we've been, as we've learned. And why do we let what was important to us as children fade away? You know, there was a time when we believed we could do anything and be anyone. And, you know, life kind of beats that out of us sometimes. And I wanted to ask why we let that happen and how we change as, as, as people when that does. So that was the main question. So it's always, a, I always am driven by a question that I want to answer myself as a person. And I think readers are fascinated um, and want answered as well. And then I kind of go back into the characters. I, you know, I am a, I ask this every week on my Wine and Words with Wade Literary Happy Hour. Are you a, you know, are you a plotter or a pantser? And I'm, I'm a total pantser. You know, I get ingrained in my characters, but I love the minute moments in life. That's what I like to write about. Um, you know, I'm never going to write about somebody that's murdering somebody or is having an affair with half of Europe. I, I think the beauty is in the simple moments of life. And that's what I love to write about. So that question kind of anchors everything. And then I build the characters and go from there. Okay. Did you know where these friends were going to ultimately end up? Or was that something you worked out along the way? I worked it out along the way. I knew, um, you know, as an 80s kid, and if anybody's out there grew up in the 80s or had kids in the 80s, it is such a massive time difference than how kids are raised today. Um, and I wanted to parallel that journey for these women, especially as mothers versus how we grew up. You know, no technology. You know, we had to write down directions to get somewhere. Um, I used a typewriter. And our life was you could get on a bike in the afternoon and not come home until nightfall and your parents thought you were okay and everything was fine. It's the way it was. Or we'd spend the entire weekend at the mall, you know, at Chess King and Sabaros and Orange Julius. And I wanted to parallel that with today, how life is for children, how we get so easily lost and forget who's directly in front of us. Yes, definitely. It's so wonderful to see your characters rediscover not only their friendship, but themselves as the story moves along and the parts of themselves that they thought they left behind in childhood. Yeah, that's, you know, that's exactly it. I, you know, I always say, looking back as a kid, we were, we didn't know fully who we are, but I think we were truly our best selves because we could believe we could be anything and anyone. And you know, it's interesting um, on, on Mother's, pre-Mother's Day, um, you know, my mother inspired that in me. You know, she always said, like when I ran off the stage, it's not you, it's them. You know, the one thing that you know, God has given us is that we are all unique souls. And too often in life, what happens is we want to fit in with everyone else. Um, we want to be just like everyone else. And so the uniqueness in it gets drummed out. Um, you know, we become very vanilla, our voice gets lost. And that's the worst things that can happen to us. So, um, you know, my mom really, <laughs> really inspired me. So I know she's, she's watching, watching down here from heaven and, and always believed that I would, I would be a writer. She actually saw my book um, two weeks before she passed away on the Today Show, um, featured on the Today Show. So she, she knew it would happen. That's wonderful. Yes. And it's so interesting to see in your book. And I mean, I know this was true for me as a child, and I think it's true for most children you've got these parents or a family who really loves you and yet you look to your friends for affirmation. And I see that happening with your girls. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh -huh. I wanna talk about that a little bit. Yeah, you know, it's, um, as a parallel, you know, it's when I lost my, um, we all get busy in life. You know, we have 
we have jobs, we have families, we have careers, we move. Um, and sometimes we distance ourselves from those who we grew up with, our childhood friends, um, people we knew from high school or college. And, um, you know, it's interesting because after my parents both died, the people that were there for me um, were the people that many times I had not stayed in touch with over the decades. Um, they resurfaced, they were there for me. Um, so I feel like, um, you know, my friends have always been my foundational element and that's never changed. So, you know, yeah, this is a book that celebrates our, our forever friends. You know, I have, I have a plaque in, in my house um, that came from um, one of my grandmother's friends actually. And it says, our friends know we're not perfect, but they treat us as if we are. And I think that sums up exactly what our friends mean to us. Definitely. Yeah. As I said, you know, I'm giving this to my two friends. We met in, in fifth grade in Michigan and here we are now at age 57 and we don't live in the same state or anything, but that connection mm -hmm. remains. Yeah. And that you celebrate that so beautifully in this novel. So, Thank you. Yeah. A couple of um, different people on the program here are asking about how you decide what to name your characters. <laughs> ah, names are so hard. Um, so hard, in fact, that I usually, when I, I do big character sketches before I start a novel, um, you know, I previously wrote humorous memoirs. So I knew who I was writing about, writing about family, friends, myself, you know, those who are near and dear. So I know all their quirks, eccentricities. So I want that to happen with, with the characters who write, but names are really hard. Um, I often start when I do my character sketches, I will like for this book, I looked through 80 popular 80s names because, you know, I think many women of that era kind of all have similar names, like, you know, women of my my mom's era, you know, there were a lot of Patties and um, Geraldines. And so I, it, but it's hard. In the beginning, I often just put XXX because I don't know which name I want to use until I get more deeply into it. But, you know, Veronica, Liz, um, Rachel, Emily, those are all top social security 80s names that I had to go with. So, and I did- also had a little bit of a framework you had to work with. And I, I had a framework because all of the, all of the books, all of the, all of the women's names, ironically, the first letters, you know, friends forever, that's E-V-E-R as I was talking about in the book. So I had to make that work as well. Right, and it did. Um, I know you have a great love for your home state of Michigan and you portray it so cinematically and beautifully in the novels, um, but you also make your home in California. Is there any chance any of your future novels would be set somewhere other than Michigan or is that a definite staying point? It's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer that in two ways. <laughs> yeah, every novel I write will, will be situated in Michigan. Um, you know, if you've, as you know, Michigan is one of the most, it's like Minnesota, one of the most beautiful states, I believe, um, not only in America, but one of the most, the most beautiful spots in the world. And the history of the state, the uniqueness of the resort towns as you travel west, north in Michigan to the UP and to the east side, they're so different. They're so incredibly beautiful um, that I don't think I'll ever run out of territory to explore. But I do have my first holiday novels coming out in October called The Secret of Snow. And it's partially set here and my other home of Palm Springs. So I juxtapose the desert and winter with how we know Michigan winters are and Minnesota winters are. So it's kind of a lovely parallel that works. So yes. And then my following novel, I'm actually, um, I for the first time I'm including my Ozarks background. And that's a really big setting in the, in the book as well. So Wonderful. I'm kind of, I'm starting to tick more boxes. Exciting. Now, does that one set in, partially in the Ozarks, is that ever a working title yet? Um, it's tentatively titled The Button Jar, and that's going to be out next um, May. Okay. You are just amazingly prolific. Can you take it for a day in your writing? Here it is. Uh, <laughs> you know, I see you start it with some coffee. <laughs> I, I start with coffee. Um, you know, it's, I say the the one silver lining of this last horrific year has been that we're able to do more things like this. Um, I do believe that these virtual events has given us the time to reach more readers, um, people that don't have the time often to make it to book events. Um, we 
we've gotten more in depth um, in, in that way. And I think that's been incredibly personal. Um, but, you know, the other silver lining has been, I've been at home in a robe writing nonstop and readers are reading more books. I mean, publishing's, you know, going through a boom right now. People want to escape. They want to leave the world. So that's that been the great. blessing. <laughs> and, and, all I've, and all I've been doing is writing. So yeah, my day, I wake, I wake early. Um, I do consume enough coffee to get me going. And I write usually four to five hours first thing in the morning before the day intrudes. You know, I like that quiet time. And then I, I'm a big exerciser, a big runner. I either work out or go for a very long run um, to kind of center myself again. I always say the more physically exhausted I get, the more mentally alert I become. So I kind of work through, especially when I run everything that I've written that morning, and I come back and make notes on where I want to start the next day, what could be improved. I don't edit. That's a separate time for me, but I do fine tune and then have a really good starting point for the next day. Then the rest of the day is all what we, it's the business of publishing, you know, um, it's all of this type of stuff that we, that authors have to do these days. I know you certainly have to be a multimedia event these days. <laughs> you do. Yes. Um, someone's asking actually about this past year of COVID and how, you know, it's making people appreciate simpler times. Do you foresee this time of lockdown informing some of your future stories? I do actually. And the button jar that, you know, COVID and um, the loss of the main character's mother um, plays a huge, huge piece of it. You know, I lost my father-in-law um, to COVID about a year ago today. And you know, it's, it changes you profoundly. Um, you know, we, you know, a huge theme of this book is the fragility of life. And um, I, I think we've all been reminded of that. And again, you know, as my grandma Shipman said, what's most important in life? I think, I hope, and I pray that we, you know, we're going to get back to normal. We're going to get back to our busy lives. We're going to be out and about, but I truly hope we can keep that peace moving forward. Yeah, definitely. So great. Um, back to your writing. Do you have any tips for some of the aspiring writers in the audience? What do you do when you get stuck? Um, um, what propels you forward? It's a great question. I could go on this for an hour. Uh, you know, I always say the, the first thing is write. Um, you know, it's interesting. I just watched the other night a movie called The Salinger Year um, with Sigourney Weaver. It's terrific. It's about a woman working at a literary agency. I'm very young in New York and um, she's kind of the conduit with J.D. Salinger when he was live. And she has a chance to be a literary agent, but she wants to be a writer and he tells her just write. And, you know, the biggest thing that any artist can do is, especially a writer, is sit down and do it. You know, you don't get better at something that you're not honing. Um, I compare it to, you know, I've run a marathon before. When I trained for it, I'm like, I don't know if I can run five miles, much less 26.2, but you do five, you get to seven, you get to 10. It's like writing, it's cumulative. You gain confidence. You can see the amount of material that's before you. Um, I also say, you know, the biggest thing that we have to overcome as souls and as writers is the ability to overcome our fear. Fear consumes, I believe, most Americans more so than does our passion. So what happens when you sit down to write is you're, you know, we only have this. Authors have a unique, we all use the same tool belt. We just tell that, you know, we have a laptop or a pen, we have the same vocabulary, um, you know, tell the same stories often, but it's the unique voice that sets us apart, how we bring that story to life. But what happens is we sit down to write and we think, I'm gonna suck at this. I'll never make a dollar. I, um, I, there's better things I should be doing. I need to get dinner on the table for my family. I need to go mow the yard. I need to get my kids to soccer practice. Um, my job is calling me. I have another email I need to do. And so this to this, bad things happen. And we don't give ourselves permission to believe in ourselves. 
And that's what has to happen as a writer. You have to believe in that voice that is calling to you because that's all we have. That's all we have. Um, and I, you know, I beg of people, um, you know, listen to yourself and believe in yourself and love yourself. Um, you know, my mom was, um, my mom was a former nurse and a hospice nurse. And she said, you know, she counseled so many patients at the end of their lives. And she said 100% of them were filled with regret, you know, regrets, you know, that they didn't do something they dreamed in their life. Um, and my mom always told me, do it. Don't have a regret. Um, you can always go backward, but you can never go forward. And she was with me the, you know, from the very moment. She's the one that told me you can write a book and you can finish a book. She was there when I put my query letters to literary agents in the mailbox. And I said, here's to nothing. And she said, here's to everything. Um, you know, believe in yourself. That's what I have to tell writers and just us as people. Um, you know, I know my mom's watching from heaven and, and knowing I did it. And it's because of her. It's because, you know, she believed in the, in the unique Wade. And um, so did my grandma. So it's, you know, that's, I could go on forever about teaching writers what to do, but a lot of it is just flicking fear aside and truly believing in who you are. I think that resonates in the Clover Girls as well. It's the main, you know, it, it's, it's the main theme. It is the fact that, um, you know, it happens in life. You grow up and you, life gets hard and you get busy and everything that you believed in or wanted to do gets put to the side. And, you know, I used to work at a private school and I knew kids that had so many dreams and their, their parents were highly successful, but they said, you're going to be an engineer. You're going to be a doctor. You're going to be an attorney like your grandfather was and run the firm. And I worked there a long time and I saw those kids come back 15 years later as very unhappy adults. So one blink of God's eye. That's what we got. And um, it even seems shorter these days. So just, you know, believe, believe in yourself and believe in what you're doing. Um, it's a gift, um, you know, us touching each other as you, our unique selves is the only gift we have. And believe me, I didn't for a long time and it changes lives. You, everybody out there can change lives. That is for sure, most definitely. Um, one more writing question for you. Which part of the process do you enjoy? Getting that first draft down and just letting the story take you or going back and seeing the revisions come? <laughs> um, if my, if my, my beloved ev editor is watching, um, uh, it's not the revision piece for me. Um, I so love getting lost in a book. You know, there'll be a new rug purchased in my home that I won't notice for six months because I'm so deeply involved in, in the book. And I get so excited to write it. Um, I become these characters that I truly wake up first thing in the morning and I run out of bed at dawn before I even walk the dogs because I want to get it down. I need to start channeling it. The revisions are hard. They're, the editing, I always say, you know, the editing is the heavy lifting of writing. You have to edit. You know, there is no way around it. You have to be an incredible writer. You also have to be a very gifted editor. They go hand in hand. And I do that at the end because it's not the creative process for me, but that's the difficult part. And, um, you know, then come the editorial letter from my editor and all the revisions. And folks don't know what that means. That means that, you know, my editor has the, she loves my books. She has, that's why she buys them. She has, she, she, has, she adores them, but she wants to make them the best they can be. And what that involves can be very minor tweaks to very major tweaks, more character depth, adding scenes. Um, things aren't working with the narrative flow. So things have to be um, reworked. And what happens is in revisions, that's like tipping a domino down. You've seen the videos where the dominoes fall for for two minutes, that's what revisions are like. You push one and everything else has to change with it. So writing. <laughs> right, as Jody Peake says, you, you can't edit a blank page. So you gotta get something you, down. Yeah. That's exactly right. You know, and I always say Mark Twain, I loved you. I always said, um, you know, I wish I could have written you a shorter letter. That's, you know, that's what, that's what good editing is, is really, um, 
you know, I was, I always call it, it's like going on a very long hike and you're taking a backpack. You can only carry so much in that backpack. Um, you're going to get exhausted. Um, so what are the necessary things that have to be in that backpack? That's like telling a great story mm -hmm. down, down to the minimum. Okay. Well, your Mark Twain reference leads us to the next question. People are wondering if there are any authors who were particular literary influences on you or who inspires you to become a writer. Yes. And I always give credit to someone when I speak. Now I, sp I say her name to colleges and um, college students and high school students and it's crickets. Um, it's Irma Bombeck. Oh, I <laughs> if, love all of, if all of you remember her, and for a couple of reasons, and I, I, I will say others as well, but, um, you know, Irma Bombeck, I saw with my grandmothers and my mother in rural America how humor bonded people. Um, you could talk about family, you could talk about loss, you could talk about anything, but if you said it in a funny way, people embraced it rather than if you preached at them. So Irma was, um, was a major influence. And you know, if you don't know her backstory, this is a woman who locked herself in her bathroom at home to escape her family just to write. That's how much it meant to her. And she made it in a male dominated field, you know, in a time when there weren't many successful female humorists. So she had the talent, but she also worked her tail off. And I admire that greatly. Um, you know, there are other many authors that I admire too. Um, you know, Ellen Hildebrand, um, Nancy Thayer, Mary Kay Andrews, Mary Alice Monroe, um, largely because they're like what I try to do this, their setting is as big a character as their characters. Mm -hmm. um, and I learned a lot from them writing about the Low Country or Nantucket mm -hmm. and how really the entire background um, was like creating, it was like going to the theater and creating a beautiful backdrop for what you're doing. And everybody interacted with that. So um, those are some other authors that you know influenced me heavily. Yeah, and they also all have new books coming out this year and their books also explore the world of female friendship really beautifully, yeah. I think it's, I, you know, and I've talked to a number of them, I think it's a theme that has resonated with writers this past year. You know, you look, our life has been virtual and you look at who's been there really to save, save us <laughs> and it's been our friends. I mean, it's been, virtual happy hours and it's been calling and saying um you know i can't see my family or my you know i'm worried about my parents or my father's sick and they've been there every step along the way and you know that's it's what this book embraces is you know our friends are everything and it's at a time when we need them more than ever that's for sure um when you settle in tonight and you're done for the day what book is it that you're going to pick up when you do your bedtime reading i have i have I'm probably like you. You are one of the most prolific readers I've ever known. I have my, <laughs> my nightstand is stacked. Yeah, my so, husband informed me I have 32 books on my nightstand. <laughs> your book mail you receive is nuts. It's just, <laughs> you read them. It's just incredible. Um, you're, you're a gift. You really are to authors. Um, I have, so you, I do a weekly um, event, a literary happy hour called Wine and Words with Wade on my Viola Shipman Facebook page every Thursday at 6.30 p.m. Eastern time. So I have best-selling authors. And this month I have four authors from Friends and Fiction joining me. I have Christy Whitson Harvey tomorrow night, um, Patty Callahan the next week, Mary Kay Andrews the next, and then Mary Alice Monroe. So all of their books, new books, are on my nightstand right now. So Christie's is Under the Southern Sky. Um, it's terrific, just hit the New York Times bestseller list. Mary Kay's is the newcomer. It's a hoot. Her All of her books are a hoot. And then Patty's is Surviving Savannah, which is a terrific. Um, yeah, that's getting great, great buzz. Mm -hmm. It's terrific. So yeah, that's, that's, so I try to cram through those in advance of my interviews, much like you do as well. <laughs> One last question I have overlooked here, um, I guess in reference to these beautiful little charms, um, clovers, do you have a lucky charm for your writing? I do actually. Um, so I'm obsessed, I have a few. I, I write, you know writers are obsessive. So I always 
I like to have a view, but I always like fresh flowers and a candle as one of them. And um, I keep my um, grandmother's, the first novel, Viola Shipman novel I wrote was The Charm Bracelet. Um, and, you know, I always keep my grandmother's charm bracelets by me and their charms, you know, they were, you know, working poor women and these little trinkets that we take for granted meant the world for them. And they told the stories of their life. And, um, you know, me having them there honors the traditions of their life. And, um, you know, I feel like they're by me with me writing every day. So, um, yeah, I always have, I always have those by me. That's wonderful. Well, your books are certainly a gift to readers everywhere, and they're going to make a wonderful, wonderful Mother's Day gift this year. So we're just about running out of time here. If anybody has any final questions, they can enter them in the Q&A box. But please remember that the um, links for shopping at either McLean and Aiken or Valley Bookseller are in the chat box. You can just copy and paste those. It'll take you right to the web page where you can add multiple copies to your shopping cart. And I say one... Cinco de Mayo it. Five, <laughs> give it five up. <laughs> and everybody also gets um, one of these really cute signed Clover Girls bookmarks that go in each book. And truly, if you've ordered a book, I urge you to support Valley Bookseller and McLean and Aiken. Please order a second copy. Please order a third copy. Order one for your best friend. Um, you it's know, a paperback original. So the paperback original. It's nicely priced at $16.99. What so you, you can you can load up on them tonight. And I always say if you do, you know, you're gonna get you're gonna get a this and a beautiful bookmark just for ordering it that you can keep for yourself or give away. And then if you order, you're entered to win this beautiful, and that I always say it's totes adorbs. <laughs> that tote is totes adorbs. It is and it has a quotation from the book, and it's just beautiful. And it's handmade by a friend, a, an artist in, in the US, and it's just gorgeous. And again, a $50 gift certificate from, from one of the two, from both stores to right. fill the bag. So, you know, I, it's, authors can never say this enough. Um, Pre-orders are hugely important to us. Um, you know, they show the publisher that, you know, people want and love the book and that gets them behind it even more. And it also, you know, Pam and Jessalyn have gone out of their way to have this beautiful event. And, um, you know, they have many copies and I just, I'm hoping in my heart to honor my mom and my grandma on Mother's Day, get a cup, get as many copies as you can. And I promise, you all will, it will touch your heart. It will indeed. I mean, I sat down and just inhaled it. I loved it. And I can't wait to share it with friends and my own mother and my mother-in-law. And so Jesslyn's going to come back here with us. I want to say, Wade, thank you so much. Thank you to everybody for tuning in. Thank you for supporting your local independent bookstore because we can't do this unless you guys shop with us. So we really appreciate every book you buy. So Jesslyn, I'll turn it over to you. I'm going to put your mic back on. <laughs> And I just wanted to follow up to say it's really interesting how the stars align because as I was listening to Wade talk, I just had a conversation with someone today. Um, we've only been open to the public for walk-in um, traffic now for about two weeks. And the thing that has struck me is that we have to always, if there's one thing we can walk away from this pandemic, I think there are many things hopefully that we will walk away from this experience with, but I would hope that we can always remember that we never know what someone is bringing to the conversation because what you see is not the only thing that is going on with someone. And I think that that as Wade was talking, I thought that's exactly what I love about Wade's books is that he's bringing so much to you through these books. I mean, books are personal. There are things in pages that will affect people in different ways. And because of the power of, of Wade's writing and the way that he goes about bringing us these beautiful stories that do make us ugly cry, I've, I've, I've been there. Um, it's just, it's, I think it's, it's the perfect thing for this time to remind us all to be maybe a little gentler a little kinder, a little more considerate of those around us, just like some of some of our mothers, mine in particular. <laughs> so, well, 
thank you again for this fabulous evening. It was such an honor to partner with you, Jessalyn, and your beautiful store, McLean and Aiken. Thank you so and much for having us. It is always such a treat to spend time with you, Wade. So thank you for this, and thank you for the gift of the Clover Girls. And um, shop local, everybody. Your brick and mortar and independent bookstore loves you. <laughs> we appreciate every purchase. We do. Keep us here. Yes. Mm -hmm. Wade, you want to give one more shout out for your Thursday wine and words and Wade? Yeah. So thank you both. As, as um, you know, both mothers for Mother's Day, I really um, appreciate it. Um, yeah. You know, I every Thursday, 6.30 p.m. Eastern time, I do wine and words with Wade. I talk about writing. I hope to provide inspiration. I talk to best-selling authors and publishing insiders, and it's a blast. I drink and I talk to um, also booksellers like Jessalyn. Um, and, you know, I do, you know, I do think this book's going to touch your heart. So please order away and support, you know, small businesses have been so incredibly effective this last year and they need our continued support more and more. And, you know, this is a perfect Mother's Day gift. And I know my mom, my mom would thank you as well. So it's been a blast. Thank you. So pre-order your copy tonight and you can pick them up either in one of the stores on the 18th or they will be mailed out to you. But this is a pre-order and we will get them to you just as quickly as we can. Thank you get all. Get that swag, win that swag. Win that swag and your golden clovers. So <laughs> thank you everyone. Happy reading to all. Good night. Thank you. Happy Mother's Day. Thank you, Wade.